Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session of our three-part Applied Remote Sensing Training, SAR for Detecting and Monitoring Floods, Sea Ice, and Subsidence from Groundwater Extraction. My name is Erica Podest, and I'm a research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, as well as an instructor with the RCEP program. I'll be hosting today's training and the rest of this webinar series. Today, I'll be joined by Dr. Eric Fielding, who's a research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He'll be focusing on measuring surface subsidence due to groundwater extraction using INSAR. To begin, I'll provide an overview of our training before we begin this session. I'll first be providing an overview of our training before we begin this session. The objective of this webinar series is for participants to learn how to use SAR to detect and address potential disasters related to sea ice, floods, and groundwater extraction. And these sorts of events can have a large impact on human lives, infrastructure, and the economy. So SAR can be critical in informing on the ground efforts, on disaster mitigation efforts, and resilience. And by the end of this webinar series, participants will be able to generate subsidence maps due to groundwater extraction in order to inform risk and resource management, detect and monitor sea ice to identify potential risks to shipping and coastal erosion. So that was the first session. And then the last session, which will be tomorrow, Wednesday, November 1st, will be uh, to detect and monitor floods in order to more closely monitor increase or decrease of floodwaters and better inform disaster response and management. And here we can see an outline of this webinar series. Today is the second session of this three-part series. All presentation slides, recordings, and Q&A transcripts are available or will be available on the training page. There will be one homework assignment, which will be which will open on the date of the final session. That will be tomorrow, Wednesday, November 1st. And that homework assignment will remain open until November 17. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment before the given date, the given due date. And finally, um, before we get started, I just wanted to remind everyone that you if you have a question, to please type it in the questions box. And under this platform, it is uh, located in a different place. It's at the bottom right under the three points. There's a, there's a drop-down menu. And uh, one of those three options in the drop-down menu is questions. So please write your questions there, and we will address all questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and feel free to uh, type in your questions as we go along. The, uh, all the questions will be assembled into a Google Doc, and that Google Doc will then be posted onto the training page with all the answers. We're very excited to have Dr. Eric Fielding as guest lecturer today. He has taught several other RSET trainings on the use of INSAR for looking at earthquakes and landslides. Today, he'll be introducing a brand new topic, which is the use of INSAR to measure subsidence due to groundwater extraction. Thank you so much, Dr. Fielding, for joining us today and for so generously sharing your knowledge and wide experience in the use of INSAR, in this case for groundwater applications. Welcome. Hello, uh, I'm going to be talking about subsidence from due to groundwater extraction. My name is Eric Fielding at the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology, a NASA laboratory. Uh, and a number of the slides today were prepared by Jen Liu, who also works with me here at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So this is part of the series of uh, seminar webinars uh, on um, using SAR for detecting monitoring and monitoring floods, sea ice, and subsidence due to groundwater extraction. 
this is session two uh, and we're, we're using um, SAR interferometry or INSAR uh, to measure the ground surface subsidence due to groundwater extraction. This uh, session uh, or part of the uh, series, uh, we want to um, give some uh, basic uh, understanding of the physics of SAR interferometry. We want to, uh, I want to describe how um, the SAR or synthetic aperture radar interferometric phase tells us about what the land surface is doing and uh, the subsidence, measurement of subsidence. And we're going to be doing a uh, demonstration of uh, data processing uh, to analyze a time series of these uh, SAR interferometry measurements to measure how the um, ground surface is changing over time. And we give a brief uh, introduction to how, how to understand the how the information from SAR interferometric images and the time series analysis reveals uh, land subsidence uh, due to groundwater extraction in addition to other uh, processes uh, not covered in this webinar. So um, to give a, a more detailed introduction, you should check these previous RSET tutorials from uh, 2017, uh, the basics of radar, synthetic aperture radar and SAR processing and data analysis and the introduction to SAR interferometry. Uh, in 2019, there was interferometric SAR for landslide observations that went into uh, making an interferogram. And last year in 2022, we did a interferometric SAR time series analysis for looking at a landslide. Uh, this year, we're gonna be using a similar type of time series analysis to do uh, subsidence uh, measurements uh, for over an area of groundwater extraction. So uh, we're gonna do a quick review. Uh, I'm gonna go through this quickly because uh, it's, it's been covered in more detail in those other webinars that you can review on YouTube. Um, the 2017 RSET training and the 2019 training uh, gives more details on the, on the deep, how we actually do uh, SAR interferometry and, and the uh, SAR interferometry interferogram production. For this tutorial, we're gonna be using data that's pre-processed and not going through those um, preliminary steps. Uh, the key thing about um, SAR interferometry is that we measure the phase of the SAR signal. Uh, a lot of the other seminars uh, in this series and, and elsewhere here in our set are using the amplitude, the the, uh, the amount of radar um, return, uh, but we're actually using the phase of the um, of the radar signal, uh, which is a a different aspect of uh, SAR that uh, is uh, unique for measuring uh, the surface subsidence. And the phase is uh, a measure of the distance between the the radar antenna over here on the, uh, shown by this cartoon, and uh, the objects on the ground that reflecting the radar. Um, the key thing is that there's millions of, uh, of uh, cycles of the radar waves uh, between the, the satellite and the ground. We don't know the, the exact number, and that's one of the uh, sources of, um, confusion sometimes in, in SAR interferometry is that all of the SAR interferometry uh, measurements are, uh, are relative. Uh, and there's this uh, extra uh, factor that the, the number objects within that um, radar pixel are, are uh, numerous and so the actual phase that's returned by a signal a single uh, radar image are relatively random, but if the objects here in this pixel stay in approximately the same location relative to each other, then we can take a second acquisition and do interferometry 
uh, or um, a very uh, basically subtraction of the phase to uh, measure this distance between the, the antenna and the ground. Not We can't measure the absolute distance, but we can measure how much the distance changed. And so as a basic um, uh, idea, we have this uh, phase that has a whole bunch of um, extra Con, uh, constants that are due to that distance um, in phase of image one and another the another image with those uh, with the same constants we can't determine those constants but if the constants uh, of, of all the, uh, the radar propagation stay uh, the same then we can take the difference and it cancels out all those other constants and we can therefore measure uh, the ground uh, surface. Uh, there's basically two types of uh, SAR interferometry. Uh, there's the mapping or, and topographic uh, determination that's uh, done by using two radar antennas that are uh, imaging the ground at the same time. The um, mission that I worked on uh, in was the uh, 2000 uh, NASA shuttle radar topography mission, uh, which was now, uh, which is recently reprocessed and released in 2018 as NASA DEM, that used the two uh, radar antennas on the space shuttle. Uh, but there's also airborne uh, systems and uh, systems such as the uh, the, the German uh, Tandem X uh, that, that also use this two satellite uh, or two antenna on a single satellite uh, method. And this uh, produces very high resolution uh, topographic maps um, by using SAR interferometry. And the second type of SAR interferometry is what we call repeat pass interferometry, where we measure the change in the ground surface, not the elevation. In this case, we actually use the elevation uh, data from uh, SRTM or another data source and subtract out the effects of that elevation to measure the displacement of the ground surface. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So in this case, uh, we're doing what we call differential interferometry. So we have the, the same radar antenna uh, or a very uh, highly similar one. Uh, basically, uh, several satellite systems now have uh, multiple uh, satellites that are uh, basically identical, and they come back to the same point in space over the Earth and at a different time, and that's repeating the pass of the uh, over the Earth. And we take the uh, phase difference, and that tells us the difference in the range or, which is shown as rho in this equation. Uh, so by taking the uh, interferogram, we can make a, a map of uh, the how much the ground moved in between those two times. Uh, and this the little uh, picture here is the map of uh, the uh, Hector Mine earthquake that happened here in Southern California in 1999. One of the key things to remember is that um, the sensitivity of uh, SAR interferometry to topography depends on the um, the distance uh, between the two radar antennas, um, and it depends on the uh, total path length. Uh, that means that uh, we're uh, limited in the resolution of measuring topography. It's usually on the order of uh, meter or, or tens of meters. SRTM had a sensitivity around uh, 10 meters. Uh, but for measuring displacements, it only depends on the radar wavelength. And that's uh, this displacement sensitivity here in the second equation. It only depends on 4 pi over the lambda, which is the radar wavelength. Um, so it's we're much more uh, sensitive to measuring uh, surface displacements, we can measure it to a small fraction of the radar wavelength. And uh, with radar wavelengths uh, presently operating satellites between three centimeters and 24 centimeters, we can measure 
uh, a few millimeters or a few centimeters of displacement. Uh, another thing that uh, can cause uh, confusion with uh, starting with the, uh, the full radar processing is the phase unwrapping step. Uh, in this particular uh, demonstration, we're going to be using data that's already been uh, unwrapped. The phase measurement that we can me uh, we do measure with SAR interferometry is actually uh, modulo 2 pi. Uh, that means that the uh, phase ends up being wrapped. That interferogram that I showed uh, previously had these color contours. Those are the wrapped fringes. Uh, the distance between each one of those contours is one um, is half of the radar wavelength. In that case, it was uh, uh, six centimeter radar. Uh, so each one of those contours was three centimeters. Uh, but to uh, and for most purposes, we want to look at the unwrapped phase. So we have to do an extra processing step to figure out where these uh, jumps are and figure out how many jumps uh, have been, need to be applied to each uh, pixel and get an unwrapped phase. Uh, it's, see the other uh, webinars for more explanation about that. The other uh, important thing is uh, what we call the correlation or coherence of the radar. We uh, measure the coherence um, uh, by doing a correlation. Uh, which is just looking at how uh, correlated the phase is for pixels that are nearby. Um, the INSAR signals uh, become incoherent uh, due to a number of processes. There's the thermal and processor noise that's uh, introduced in the in the radar acquisition and the uh, uh, in, in the radar signal processing. There, that's generally pretty low in most cases. Uh, there's the um, effects of the, the geometry. If the radar antennas are further apart, then we start to get some different geometry and uh, volumetric scattering. In some cases, if the radar uh, antenna is rotated, that adds, adds uh, to the noise. And then there's this uh, issue that I mentioned at the beginning of uh, whether those objects that are um, reflecting the radar stay in the same uh, location within the pixel. Um, if there's things moving around within the pixel, then that also um, causes uh, loss of coherence or, or decorrelation. And um, that's one of the, uh, the key um, Sources that that is the the key source of noise for SAR interferometry, and one of the things that we try to uh, estimate in the uh, analysis to have a better idea of what the the quality is of the final measurements, because this this uh, uh, correlation emit, uh, directly affects the height and displacement accuracy. And if the correlation is very low, then it affects the uh, ability to unwrap the phase correctly. So the uh, other key thing is that the correlation effects are multiplied instead of added. Uh, some of the other effects in SAR interferometry are added together, but the correlation uh, or coherence is multiplied. So that means that if any one of these factors is low, then the total uh, coherence is going to be low. So that's one of the things to remember uh, when looking at um, uh, interferometric um, products. And so, as I mentioned earlier, the three radar wavelengths that we use uh, for most satellites these days uh, are L band, that's 24 centimeters. Uh, C band, that's six centimeters, and X band, that's three centimeters. Um, in this uh, particular um, slide over here, we actually have the uh, L band and X band acquired at the same time. This was from the shuttle imaging radar mission that flew in 1994. 
where we had uh, actually all three of these radar wavelengths operated at the same time. And you can see there's quite a, a lot of difference between the pattern of radar backscatter uh, at the different radar wavelengths. Uh, the L band tends to go through the trees and uh, reach the ground, uh, which is better for SAR interferometry in, in, if you have any type of vegetation. Uh, whereas the X band tends to bounce off the tops of the trees, and therefore, uh, if the trees are moving around, then the repeat pass interferometry can become incoherent. C band is somewhere in between. Uh, and also uh, can also be affected by heavy vegetation. Uh, the NICER mission that's going to be launched next year will have a, an additional band that's uh, 12 centimeters. It's called S band. And we can take a, a look and see what the effects of the radar wavelength are on the coherence. But this is also from the shuttle imaging radar mission. Um, the Shuttle uh, radar mission uh, in 1994 flew twice in April and October. Uh, so we have a six month time interval. They managed to steer the shuttle, the space shuttle, into exactly the same location over the Earth so that we could do the SAR interferometry. And on the left of these two figures is the uh, C band or five, six centimeter uh, wavelength. On the right is the L band. And we can see that the coherence is much higher at L band than it is at C band. Over here on the right panel here is a, a map of the normalized difference vegetation index, a standard measurement of uh, vegetation uh, content. And you can see the high uh, similarity between the vegetation index and the L and the coherence shows that the uh, vegetation is is the main cause of the loss of coherence uh, during this six month time interval. So that's the uh, background about SAR and SAR interferometry. Uh, these are uh, some tables about the satellites that are available for doing SAR interferometry. These are the um, satellites that uh, have been around for a while. Or, but are largely now not in operation. Uh, the most of the early uh, SAR interferometry work was done with the European ERS-1 and ERS-2 uh, between 1992 and uh, 2001. Uh, ERS-2 actually lasted for another 10 years, but the um, gyroscopes weren't working well, and it um, the data from that time interval are more difficult to use. Uh, Canadian uh, Space Agency launched uh, Radar Sat 1 and it operated from 1995 to 2013. The European Space Agency launched Envisat in 2003. It operated until 2010. Uh, it actually was operated in, uh, from October 2010 to April 2012 in a different orbit, which was much less useful for SAR interferometry. Uh, the Japanese uh, space agency, uh, Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, launched a satellite called ALOS that was on operated from 2006 to 2011. All of the ALOS data is now available online from the uh, Alaska, the NASA Alaska Satellite Facility. The German Space Agency launched two satellites, Terras RX and Tandem X. They fly close to each other to allow that uh, topographic mapping. And those two are still actually in operation. Uh, Italian Space Agency launched uh, four Cosmos SkyMet satellites. Uh, one of those has been retired, but they have started operating uh, newer next generation satellites. Canadian Space Agency launched RadarSat 2. That's almost only used for commercial purposes, uh, but it's still in operation. So the, the newer spacecraft that are present or the main uh, spacecraft used today are uh, Copernicus, Sentinel-1, uh, 
and it jap the JAXA ALOS-2 satellite. Sentinel-1 had uh, two satellites launched into the same orbit, uh, Sentinel-1A, Sentinel-1B. Sentinel-1B had a problem in December 2021, so it stopped operations. Sentinel-1A is still operating. Sentinel-1C satellite uh, is ready to replace uh, Sentinel-1B. Uh, the satellite is sitting there waiting for a ride to space. Uh, and they're not sure when that's going to be, but we hope it's going to be in, in sometime next year. And of course, I work at NASA, so uh, we are very much looking forward to the NASA ISRO SAR mission that is planned for launch in early 2020. I'll say more about that in a minute. There are other um, satellites. The Argentine Space Agency has launched two satellites in the SALCOM-1 series. Um, the amount of data acquired is uh, somewhat limited, and uh, the data access has, uh, requires getting an arrangement with uh, the Argentine Space Agency. Uh, the Jap JAXA is planning to launch ALOS-4. Um, it's also ready for launch, but is waiting for its uh, rocket to be uh, ready to launch. Uh, the Italian Cosmos SkyMed Next Generation, they've launched two of those. They have two more ready to be launched. Canadian Space Agency launched the RadarSat Constellation mission, uh, and it has three satellites, uh, uh, but that data is more primarily being acquired over Canada and available for Canadians. Uh, there's been a number of other satellites. Uh, I should point out the Spanish PAUSE satellite, which is basically a, a clone of Terras RX. It's um, launched into the same orbit to be, allow um, acquisitions uh, and, and repeat passenger parameter with Terras RX. The new space satellites, uh, Capella, Ice Eye, and Umbra, those are acquiring data, but they had, do not have the uh, orbit control to systematically do um, SAR interferometry, although they have had some uh, cases where they were able to get see the satellites were getting close and able to do uh, SAR interferometry on, on a few uh, examples. So I should say a little bit more about the uh, NASA ISRO SAR mission. NISAR. The NISAR mission was um, is ready for launch. Uh, we are hoping it's going to be launched in February, just a few months from now. It's presently in India um, at the ISRO uh, testing facility. Or, uh, test, they've connected the, the radar structure with the main spacecraft uh, bus built by ISRO and they're testing all the components and uh, it will be uh, launched on an uh, ISRO rocket uh, from India uh, we hope uh, in February or, or March of 2024. As I mentioned earlier it has uh, two radar wavelengths uh, the L-band radar built by NASA and the S-band radar built by ISRO and they're both in the same structure uh, but it, using a um, reflector, uh, unlike a lot of the other radar systems, so that we can actually operate the L-band and the S-band simultaneously. And all the science data will be uh, free and open uh, and available from uh, the S-band from ISRO and the L-band from NASA. Uh, there's, it's going to have a 240-kilometer-wide uh, swath, very similar to the Sentinel-1, uh, but we're using a different uh, technique. It's called SweepSAR, uh, which makes the uh, SAR interferometry much uh, easier to uh, deal with because uh, there's some issues in the, in the way that the uh, Sentinel-1 satellites operate that uh, add extra complexity. Uh, which we believe uh, the ISRO, uh, the NISAR um, SweepSAR method will uh, avoid and uh, provide better quality data over um, overall land. 
Uh, that's the, uh, the other thing about uh, the NICEAR mission is that it's designed to have a very high uh, capability of acquiring and downlinking data. So it's going to be turned on over land every time it's uh, over, over all land. And uh, the other thing is that it's going to be uh, uh, operated in a mode where it's looking to the uh, south, so it's going to have much better coverage of Antarctica than uh, existing uh, previous uh, radar satellites, uh, which generally look uh, to the north, uh, except during uh, temporary uh, change in, changes in their configuration. Uh, so uh, we'll, I can't get into too much detail, the, the, but you can see the uh, nisar.jpl.nasa.gov website for a lot more information about NISAR. So um, now I'm going to talk about uh, using uh, not, uh, SAR interferometry to measure subsidence from space. On the left here is a uh, actually a, an old image uh, made by uh, Gio Peltzer uh, here at JPL. Uh, when he first started looking for uh, doing SAR interferometry over the Los Angeles area to look for faults, he saw this very strange pattern in the area of uh, near Pomona. And it turns out that uh, there was uh, groundwater extraction here. He made this uh, neat uh, three-dimensional perspective view uh, of the uh, INSAR phase and added in the uh, uh, AAA street map here to show how that uh, ground surface is hi highly exaggerated. The actual amount of deformation here is 15 centimeters, and it was over two years. Um, but it definitely was a, uh, distorting the ground surface here in the, near the city of Pomona. On the right is an example of um, uh, subsidence that happened in Arizona. Uh, it's a big problem with groundwater extractions in some parts of Arizona, and um, they had their uh, rates up to about 10 cent, uh, 11 centimeters per year, and it causes uh, problems such as these localized sinkholes, uh, fault reactivation, uh, and many other problems. So, how does um, the extraction of groundwater actually caused the ground surface to go down. Um, this is a, a cartoon from a, a paper by uh, Devin Galloway and others. Uh, we have this uh, sand and gravel in the uh, subsurface, and especially the, uh, the silt or, or clay layers in the um, in the subsurface has. Um, the uh, the clay uh, particles are um, generally sort of flat. So when you if you take the water out of it, then those particles will rearrange themselves and and collapse, and that reduces the volume, which then lowers the land surface. So just some part of that when when these uh, clay layers uh, have the water extracted, then it tends to uh, permanently uh, reduce the volume of water that it can store because the particles have been rearranged. In the more sandy layers, uh, the ground surface can be uh, can recover uh, because the the clay, uh, sand particles uh, do not completely collapse, but the water can uh, can be re refill the the spaces. So there's, uh, in most cases, there's a, a both a seasonal uh, variation of water that causes a uplift and subsidence, and there's a, a long-term uh, irreversible inelastic uh, subsidence. Uh, this is an example of the seasonal deformation over the area of uh, Los Angeles uh, and Santa Ana. There's a, a big uh, groundwater basin called the Santa Ana Basin to the uh, southeast of Los Angeles. Uh, and if we look at um, in April to September uh, during the dry season interferogram, that shows uh, 
several centimeters of subsidence. If we look at a February to August, we also see subsidence. But if we look at a September to January interferogram, uh, we see actually uplift. If you look carefully, the uh, the colors of these fringes are going the opposite direction. And that means that uh, the ground has gone back up during the rainy season. And if we take a, a one-year interferogram from 1996 to 1997, we can see that the uh, ground surface actually reached the same level uh, after one year of going down and then back up. So this is the seasonal deformation that's due to those um, more sandy layers where the groundwater has been recharged. Uh, so the, the paper is here uh, listed on the slide. So most of what I'm going to be talking about, to, we're going to be talking about today is a, the Central Valley of California. The Central Valley is this very large valley uh, that runs a large part of the state. The northern part is called the Sacramento Valley. The southern part is called the San Joaquin Valley. Most of the subsidence is happening in the San Joaquin Valley. This is a, a huge uh, agricultural area and uh, has uh, estimated agricultural output of uh, about $17 billion a year. It's also about one sixth of all the irrigated land in the United States. And uh, it's about one fifth of all the groundwater extraction is from this uh, aquifer system. Uh, so, as I mentioned, one of the uh, earlier satellites is this ALOS uh, PAL satellite from JAXA. This is a, a profile showing uh, uh, this uh, on the left here is the wrapped interferogram because this is L band. These color contours are 12 centimeters. Uh, so, there's a total of about 24 centimeters of subsidence. Uh, and on the right here, we're comparing the on the red line. Uh, is the uh, interferometry measurements in the blue line, the water elevation. And we can see as the water has been extracted over this uh, four year interval, uh, generally going down, the, the land surface is also going down. This is a uh, animation of that uh, groundwater extraction uh, subsidence bowl uh, with a, th a fancy uh, 3D animation. Uh, showing the subsidence between 2007 and 2011 uh, as both color and uh, a highly exaggerated uh, vertical uh, motion. This is, you know, exaggerated probably a million times. It's, uh, it's a total uh, deformation around 70 centimeters over those four years. So this is the uh, subsidence bowl that in the, in the southern San Joaquin Valley that we're going to be looking at in more detail uh, in the demonstration later. So this is another uh, way of uh, comparing the um, the PALSAR uh, measurements in the, in the red line to the uh, to a GPS station that's uh, in in the same uh, area. The blue, the green line here is the uh, GPS measurement, which is measured can, every day. Um, the PALSAR data is acquired roughly once a month, uh, once every uh, uh, two months. Uh, the PALSAR data uh, only covers between 2007 and 2011. Um, we also have uh, the water surface elevation uh, measurements. The uh, the water surface elevation is with the uh, on the on the right uh, uh, axis uh, here with the blue colors, and they only measure the water surface elevation tw uh, once a year or twice a year. So we don't see the the details of the seasonal variations but we can see this sawtooth pattern as the ground as the water recovers during the uh, rainy season uh, but is withdrawn during the summer dry season um, there was a an overall 
a rapid decrease between 2007 and 2010. Uh, when, when there was a drought, the, the water levels recovered somewhat in 2011 uh, and 2012 when there was more rainfall and they extracted less water. This is a major uh, issue in the state of California. They passed a new law in uh, 2015 after seeing some of these uh, extreme amounts of subsidence due to the groundwater extraction. And it's a uh, the uh, California Department of Water Resources has been using soil interferometry since about 2014 uh, to monitor the effects of this groundwater extraction. Uh, in, in the, the Central Valley and, and other parts of the state. Uh, this is another um, map uh, showing using the uh, Sentinel-1 data uh, and comparing uh, the, uh, so Sentinel-1 uh, is, was launched in 2014 or really started acquiring data in 2015. Uh, so this ha is a comparison on the right here between the 2015-2017 uh, Sentinel-1 data uh, and the, the ALOS-2 from 2007 to 2011 10. Um, the pattern is very similar, uh, but the subsidence was actually even faster. These are in rates per year uh, during 2015 to 2017 because we had another drought. Uh, during those years. Uh, we've had uh, drought is a, is a, uh, on, comes and goes in California and uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, the groundwater extraction uh, ex vary, rates vary dramatically between one year and the next, uh, depending on how much rainfall uh, there was. This particular year, 2023, we had a huge amount of rainfall in the in the rainy season, and the groundwater extraction has been uh, uh, very almost completely stopped. Uh, in fact, they're actually uh, allowing a lot of the water to uh, excess water uh, to uh, be uh, go back into the ground to recharge some of these aquifers uh, with the uh, huge amount of rain that we had in 2023. Uh, these are comparisons between the, um, the radar uh, INSAR time series and with uh, more GPS stations. And we can see the very uh, close match between the, uh, the GPS and the INSAR, uh, both on the uh, overall long-term uh, subsidence and the, uh, the seasonal cycles. And this is a, a comparison between the uh, water surface elevation uh, again and at a well that was monitored more uh, more frequently. Uh, this well uh, was located in the San Joaquin Valley. This was published in uh, Jean Liu's paper here. Uh, let's see, yeah, the Geosciences 2019. Uh, the orange line shows the uh, water surface elevation and the blue line shows the uh, uh, the ground subsidence. And we noticed that the uh, groundwater uh, subs uh, elevation minimum was in 2015 or late 2015, but the groundwater, um, I mean the surface uh, elevation uh, change actually had a minimum almost a year later and that indicates uh, that there's likely a, a latency or a lag as, as the uh, um, the deeper groundwater layers can take uh, maybe a year for the water to reach uh, those deeper levels. So even though the water level started in, uh, recovering in 2016 and 2017, uh, the surface elevation did not recover as uh, until much later. And this is also a comparison uh, with um, precipitation and the um, uh, it, the precipitation here in the, in the cyan colors at the bottom. We can see this big impulse of higher precipitation in 2017. 
uh, at the end of that particular drought. Uh, on the top here is a measurement of the overall uh, mass of water in the entire um, area that's measured with the GRACE satellite, uh, gravity satellite. And we can see that the gravity satellite is also showing the same uh, overall removal of, of water for over the whole, whole basin. So uh, I'm going to give a demonstration now. Um, we're going to be using uh, data from the, uh, the pre-processed interferograms from the Sentinel-1 satellite uh, that were, that's been uh, systematically processed by the ARIA project under the uh, Getting Ready for NISAR um, uh, system. Uh, NASA had wanted to systematically process some of the Sentinel-1 data over a number of places around the world so that uh, people could start getting used to using these um, uh, systematically processed geocoded unwrapped interferograms. And these are now archived at the uh, NASA ASF DAC. Um, the data format of these um, interferograms is very similar to the similar to the uh, unwrapped interferograms that are going to be processed for NISAR. So we feel it's very important for people to start using these uh, for prepare for NISAR, but they're also useful in themselves. And you can find the available um, pre-processed uh, data by searching at the Alaska Satellite Facility uh, DAC search um, tool. And you can also uh, download the data through the ARIA tools package. The ARIA tools package is written here. And uh, there's documentation uh, for that at their ARIA tools documentation uh, GitHub. Um, then uh, once we've downloaded the, R the unwrapped interferograms, we can do a time series analysis to see how the groundwater is uh, subsiding uh, over a, mount a time interval. We are doing uh, using this uh, package called MintPy that does the time series analysis. Um, once we've got the, the ARIA data set up, uh, we can load it into MintPy and extract uh, how the water, uh, the groundwater uh, is changing over time. And um, MintPy is also available open source on GitHub. And we, from this uh, web, page and uh, has an excellent tutorial system uh, with some more of these notebooks. In fact, with the notebook I'm going to be using here today is uh, uh, adapted from one of the Mint Pine notebooks. So um, I'm going to do a demonstration. Uh, this uses the, that uh, the pre-processed data, I'm going to be using um, a special uh, cloud processing system that uh, you can get an account uh, to use. Uh, the Alaska Satellite Facility has a thing called the Open SAR Lab, and you, you, they can uh, provide for non-commercial purposes. You can get a, uh, a, a virtual machine that runs on the, in the Amazon cloud to do these calculations. It's all pre-configured so you can run these notebooks without having to do um, your own installation. Um, and I'm going to be using that system to, uh, to run this notebook. See this website for uh, requesting an account on the OpenSAR lab. Also like to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, Zhang Yunjun, uh, who is one of the main authors of MintPy, he's made a huge amount of effort to uh, build this uh, system for the time series analysis. There's a, a number of people that have worked at uh, JPL on the ARIA um, processing, especially Harash Fatahi and David Beckard, uh, and on the on the time series analysis. 
and the Open SAR Lab team that uh, built that system to uh, better uh, uh, to make it available and maintain it. And of course, uh, uh, the sponsors uh, at NASA, and uh, we uh, a lot of the JPL analysis was actually supported by the California Department of Water Resources. Uh, these are the uh, email addresses for me and uh, Jean Liu. If you want a, a detailed uh, questions about uh, the use of SAR to, in SAR to measure subsidence, Jen is probably the better person to ask. Uh, and the RSET website. So, thank you for this. That's the uh, concludes the, uh, the main slide presentation. I'm going to go now to the uh, the notebook. So uh, the Jupyter notebook. Uh, we don't have don't have time to go into details about how Jupyter notebooks work. So I'm just going to go through this. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a notebook that was originally uh, developed for the Mint by the Mint by uh, uh, group uh, by um, Harash Vatahi and Jean Yunjun. Also with uh, David Beckhart, uh, we um, showed last year the uh, Los Angeles landslide time series analysis. So we modified it again to do uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to be using uh, a data set that was pre-processed for uh, the Central Valley of California that was uh, part of the uh, used for the NISAR solid earth team uh, algorithm theoretical basis documents um, and that notebook is also available uh, at this website uh, this github site and we're going to be using the aria s1 uh, sentinel one uh, geocoded unwrapped interferograms pre-processed uh, under the griffin project um, to save time in this demonstration, I'm going to be uh, we've pre uh, pre done uh, downloaded the data and ran the uh, ARIA tools processing. I put the steps in here, uh, but we, we've uh, taken the data already pre processed and staged it uh, into uh, the Amazon uh, Web uh, data set. Uh, uh, in the, the uh, Amazon um, simple storage system, the S3. Um, so the data is already preloaded uh, for that specific area, and we're going to be using that just to save time during this demonstration. So uh, this first uh, uh, cell of the notebook, I'm going to just uh, clear all, clear the previous run here. Uh, just sets up, uh, imports the uh, the software and sets up the uh, imports uh, MintPy software. Uh, the next one here, is we're going to be using a, a, pre -pro a data set that we had previously processed for the Central Valley, uh, track 144. Uh, and uh, this next uh, cell says we're going to use the stage data here. Uh, so it's already been pre-processed and uh, into, uh, that we already ran the time series analysis. Uh, so it just, these, uh, these uh, commands here just uh, go to the uh, Amazon S3 bucket and uh, download the, uh, the pre-processed zip file because it's going from one Amazon uh, website to another, it can download very quickly. It's downloaded three, two gigabytes in just a few uh, seconds or less than a minute. Um, in this case, it's uh, it's finished preparing the stage data because I've already done, uh, it unzips it. Uh, if In this case, I already unzipped it. So it's just skip that step. Uh, but when you run this notebook, it'll it'll do the unzipping. I put in here the commands to run the ARIA commands to do the download the exact same data set. You can modify these commands to download data for any other place on 
the, where the ARIA data is available, um, if you want, or to download a different time interval. In this case, we're only downloading the data from the year 2018 to uh, limit the, the amount of time that uh, we're going to analyze. And there's a total of um, uh, 90 uh, scenes, uh, 90 interferograms processed by the R uh, in the ARIA uh, geocoded unwrapped interferograms uh, for that time interval. Uh, Uh, these are commented out. That's what the uh, little hash symbol is at the beginning. So they're not actually running anything. Uh, but you can uncomment them if you want to uh, see. So we're going to be using uh, the, the MintPy um, analysis program, small baseline app.py. And it's. Uh, if you run just small baseline app dash dash help, and then it prints out a, a list of how all the parameters work. Um, the next thing you have to do is set up a, a configuration file. This, this cell sets up a, a configuration file that we're going to be using uh, to process this data set. It's, um, it's just uh, saying where the data is located and um, there were uh, some other parameters about how we're going to be doing the processing. Uh, these are the steps again of how to do the ARIA processing. This is the uh, step to actually load the, the data into the um, MintPy dataset because uh, I've run this before, it ran very quickly. Uh, so the in, uh, when you run MintPy, it uh, loads all the data into this um, uh, directory called inputs. Uh, there's this over here on the left here is the inputs directory. Uh, it has these two main files, uh, geometry dot geo and the interferogram stack. That's the interferograms um, loaded into uh, the MintPy format. And if we look, we can run this info.py to see what's in that uh, interferogram directory. There's 86 interferograms and each interferogram has been, um, has an area of uh, 1,177 uh, 1, pixels by 3,000 pixels. Um, and there's different layers. One of those layers is the coherence. That's the um, uh, correlation-based coherence, spatial coherence that we mentioned, mentioned earlier, uh, and the unwrapped phase, uh, plus other information such as the date of each, uh, the two dates that were used to make that acquisition, and the uh, perpendicular baseline between uh, the uh, data sets. There's also a geometry file that has all the information about the azimuth and incidence angle of the two lines, line of sight angles, and the, uh, the height of the DEM at that location. Uh, I'm going to just run all the rest of the cells here. Um, one of the things that uh, for some satellites is important is the, how the perpendicular baseline is varying with time. Uh, with the Sentinel-1 satellites, they keep the, uh, the perpendicular baselines very short. So basically that we don't have to worry about this, but for other satellites, sometimes this is uh, something we have to worry about. Um, uh, this plot here shows the uh, coherence matrix. Uh, that's the coherence for each one of the pairs. It's generally, it's all here in the blue. Uh, it means that all the, co the coherence of all these interferograms is high and they're good quality. And the bottom plot here shows the network of the, uh, each one of these lines is one of the interferometric pairs connecting the dots where the dates of the acquisitions are. And you can see uh, for this purpose, we're using 
uh, the interferograms that have short time intervals, not uh, long time intervals. Uh, and because this is an agricultural area uh, where the long time intervals tend to lose coherence. One of the other uh, things that's included with the um, the uh, you coded unwrapped interferograms is something called the uh, the connected components mask. Um, that's a mask of how well the uh, phase is uh, is connected, and you can see there's an area here to the east. Uh, that's not well connected. That's the Sierra Nevada Mountains, where uh, some of the uh, interferograms in the winter are, are snow covered. And there's some other places here where uh, some of the interferograms are, are less connected. Uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that the interferograms are measured relative to uh, a reference point. Uh, so we have to choose a reference point. In this particular case, uh, we uh, allowed the mint pie to choose the reference point. It goes and grabs, uh, uh, looks at the, the average of that spatial coherence map and finds a place that where the coherence is high. And it shows the uh, reference point here at uh, latitude 36.6 degrees, uh, longitude 119.26. So that all the measurements will be relative to this reference point uh, in in the rest of the analysis. Uh, the next step is to run the uh, the actual network inversion. We take those pairs of interferograms and do a, a least squares inversion to estimate what uh, deformation there is on each point, uh, each date, and each point. Uh, and then uh, we can take that set of dates and calculate the velocity, which is the average velocity over the course of that year. In this case, we're uh, calculating the velocity over the, over the year of 2018. And then this next plot here, we measure the, we plot the measured velocity. This black square here is the uh, reference point. So all these velocities are relative to this reference point. Um, in the green colors are the areas where it's basically close to zero uh, a displacement relative to the reference point, and this large blue area is the area of, of the rapid subsidence uh, due to the groundwater extraction uh, in, this, in the San Joaquin Valley. These white areas are the areas where the um, the coherence is low, and we decided we mass those out as being uh, unreliable uh, measurements due to low uh, temporal coherence, which I'll talk about in a minute. And that's the area to the east when the Sierra Nevada Mountains where there was snow cover. There's also this sort of oblong area to the uh, uh, in the little bit to the left of. Uh, of the and below the center, that's an area of uh, the that floods every year, tends to flood every year. It's called the Tulare Lake. That lake actually flooded uh, dramatically this year uh, due to the extreme rainfall in 2023. So the uh, the area of low coherence is going to be much larger for 2023 uh, due to that uh, flooding. Um, and we can see that the color scale here is going down to uh, 25 centimeters at the bottom. So there's actually a very large amounts of, uh, and this is in, these, these have been converted to centimeters per year. And so these this subsidence rates are, are very high, up to 30 centimeters per year uh, during 2018. There are other places in the world, especially uh, Mexico City, uh, that are subsiding even faster than than this area. Uh, I think in some cases, in some years, uh, Mexico City is subsiding at up to 60 centimeters per year. So these rates are are very high in in many parts of the world, um, and especially here. So as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, the coherence of each individual interferogram. 
um, and midpoint will take the average of the coherence of all the interferograms. And we can see that area of the Tulare Lake has low coherence in a lot of the interferograms and the area in the high um, Sierra Nevada mountains that has high uh, low, low coherence. Uh, so the average is low in those two areas. And there's some uh, agricultural fields that also have low coherence uh, because, only because they get plowed the fields or did some other agricultural uh, modification in a lot of these areas. Some of the agriculture in this area is um, orchards of uh, almonds and other uh, oranges and other trees. Uh, and those tend to be uh, higher coherence because they don't, uh, they don't plow the, the ground surface. And the trees are, are fairly far apart. So uh, the second, um, so that's the average spatial coherence. That's the coherence that's measured by the spatial correlation of the phase. We can also measure coherence as a, a in, in the temporal domain because we have a time series now. Uh, we can measure how the uh, phase is varying over time, and we can see uh, that there's actually a very similar pattern uh, in the spatial coherence and the temporal coherence. That's a good indication that uh, that they're both measuring the same kind of uh, processes. But the, um, the temporal coherence is actually the uh, method that's best, most accurate for um, estimating the errors in, in the velocity. So uh, that's why MintPy uh, estimates the temporal coherence and it also, uh, for the velocity maps, uh, like this one back here, this is actually applying a mask based on a, on a threshold applied to the temporal coherence, uh, which you can adjust if you want to uh, use a different threshold. Another uh, way to look at the error analysis is to uh, look at the standard deviation. Um, because we're doing a linear fit to the velocity uh, with time, uh, there's some uh, standard deviation of the uh, or residuals uh, from that linear fit, and that gives an idea of uh, the likely errors in the estimate of the linear velocity. In this case, the um, the errors can be very high in the, in the area of the Sierra Nevada because of uh, uh, atmospheric effects, uh, but there's also uh, substantial errors uh, in the area of the groundwater subsidence. Um, that are due to that seasonal variation that's not included in this linear fit. The other thing you'll notice is that the um, the errors are smaller and close to the reference point, and that's because the atmospheric effects are all set to zero at that reference point, uh, but the atmosphere uh, local atmospheric variations that are, uh, in, tend to increase with, with distance. And so um, one of the important things to remember when you is that you should look at this uh, standard deviation of the velocity uh, before interpreting the velocity um, because this gives an idea of what the error in the, in the velocity is. So the uh, and it's highly dependent on where that reference point is. We can also uh, plot a, a transect across the, um, the subsidence bowl uh, using MintPy. In this case, I've just drawn a line across the, the part where it's subsiding the fastest. And uh, this line in dashed on the left and the, on the right is that section. We can see the the rates here exceed 30 centimeters per year in the, in the part with the fastest subsidence, but it's actually it's quite a, a variable uh, pattern, and that depends on the details of the uh, groundwater extraction uh, and the uh, the distribution of those aquifer um, uh, clay layers or aquitards uh, that that are the main cause of the subsidence. So um, this is a very quick introduction to uh, 
how we use SAR interferometry to uh, to measure uh, groundwater extraction. Uh, there's uh, some reference material here on how uh, to use uh, MintPy and uh, ARIA tools. And uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thanks. Oh, um, well, there's one other thing I wanted to show. Uh, the, uh, we can also uh, take this uh, final output and put it into um, Google Earth. So this is um, the, uh, we took that final uh, velocity map and made a, a KMZ file that you can then load into Google Earth and display uh, with uh, with uh, Google Earth. Thanks. Thank you for that excellent presentation, Dr. Fielding. And uh, thanks to all participants for the questions that have been coming in. We've been gathering them on a Google Doc, and we will start our Q&A session right now. Dr. Fielding is online, and he'll be answering all questions. Great. So we'll be sharing the Google Doc here uh, shortly. In the meanwhile, uh, we've shared with you the link to the GitHub, and also we realized that in the demo, the text was a little hard to follow on the Jupyter Notebook. We will be uh, fixing that on the video that we will be posting online. Okay, so uh, welcome, Dr. Fielding. Hello, yes. Uh, uh, so Let's get started then with, uh, let's just start working our way down the questions that have been coming in. Uh, the first question, is the transmitted wave considered in the decorrelation effects? Yes, uh, the key thing about these radar satellites is they have a very stable system for transmitting the exact same wave uh, pattern repeatedly over many, many years. So that if if that pattern were to change, it, it could be uh, cause decorrelation, but because these satellites are designed to have this very stable system, they that is not a significant source of decorrelation. Okay, great. Question number two. With L-band data sets, can I estimate ground deformation caused by soil water potential on a steep slope in the case of landslide and subsidence? How can multi-frequency be add an added advantage for this sort of application? So the L-band SAR uh, is actually, uh, can be used to estimate the, the soil moisture content and that will be um, one of the products that's uh, going to be produced by the NISAR mission. The, um, they will be producing soil moisture maps uh, globally uh, at 200 meter resolution. And they will, people will be doing similar analysis with the S-band radar wavelength that's um, more sensitive to the shallow part of the soil. I'm not sure if ISRO is planning to do that systematically. Uh, we know that NASA is planning to, to systematically process all the L-band uh, for soil moisture. The that uh, soil moisture is estimated using the radar amplitude images, but the so the the phase of the images what they we use for INSAR analysis is is how we is a different type of analysis of the same data that we can then use to measure the ground displacements due to landslides or, or groundwater extraction subsidence. The S-band uh, SAR phase can be similarly analyzed for in-SAR displacements, and um, that will uh, should give a, approximately the same result, but the differences between the two radar wavelengths will allow us to better understand the effects of uh, the ionosphere with some uh, 
the uh, uh, the effects of soil moisture and vegetation on the INSAR measurements. Uh, those are aspects that are kind of more advanced that uh, that could be could be uh, useful in the future. Great. I will be certainly looking forward to that L band uh, data from and S band data from uh, NISAR for these sort of applications. So the next question then is what climate regions have you noticed that these surface subsidences occur the most from groundwater extraction? Well, uh, people extract groundwater in places where they don't have enough water from rivers, rain, and snow to use for their needs, such as uh, uh, cities uh, and or agriculture. So the places where there's more groundwater extraction are the places where there's not enough rainfall. So um, we see the effects of... Uh, Groundwater extraction in places where there's much less precipitation. In in places where it rains all the time, typically the there's no need to extract water from from the ground. Okay. okay. Question number four: Can Jupyter notebook be used at insert analysis over area in the world? And how much processing time and computational power? is required to do this processing on a local machine uh, using Jupyter Notebook. So this uh, particular demonstration is using uh, the pre-processed interferograms from the ARIA um, processing of Sentinel-1 geocoded unwrapped interferograms. These interferograms are available from the NASA ASF data archive. Uh, you can search for them there. They're uh, processed for some parts of the world, but they're not available everywhere. For other parts of the world, you would get do your own uh, INSAR, um, process your own interferograms. Um, because we're using these pre-processed interferograms, it, a lot of the processing has already been done. Um, and the uh, analysis, but uh, the total analysis time that it takes to run the notebook will depend on how many scenes you process. Uh, that for this particular demonstration, I used just one year of data. If I had used uh, five, six years of data, it would have taken much longer. Um, the other thing is that these geocoded unwrapped interferograms are gonna be one of the standard products from the NISAR mission. So uh, while the uh, Sentinel-1 uh, geocode unwrapped interferograms from the ARIA project are only available for limited areas. For NISAR mission, they will be available um, globally. Okay, question number five. How do you check for atmospheric interference in the interferogram stack that you use for this small uh, baseline in order to remove those effects if needed? The, uh, the time series analysis is one of the uh, key ways to uh, check for atmospheric interference, uh, especially in the troposphere. Tropospheric water vapor is one of the uh, effects that causes uh, uh, insar signals. The uh, by doing a, a fit to a year of data, that's one of the ways that I reduce the uh, time series, the uh, atmospheric effects in measuring the velocity of the ground subsidence in this particular demonstration. So by doing a, a time series fit, uh, that's uh, one of the ways to do it. There's also some more advanced ways of using weather models uh, that I have an estimate of what the water, how the water vapor is varying over time. And um, that is a function that's available in it by, but I didn't have time to cover that today. Okay, so the next question, how long will it take us uh, to be approved for an ASF account? Uh, 
I don't know the exact time. Uh, if uh, if a thousand people suddenly apply today, I think it'll take a while, maybe a week or two. Uh, it, usually, it, it's just a, a day or two. But uh, if a lot of people are applying on the same day, it, it could take much longer. Yeah, and this is also a question that we can um, bring up tomorrow. Uh, the guest lecturer is Dr. Franz Meyer, and he's the chief scientist for the uh, ASF DAC, and he will probably be able to uh, provide a, um, an answer, a timeline for, for this question. So the next question then, how could you uh, please send the GitHub repo link? And I think this was posted on the chat box, but we can include it here. Uh, yes, we had the, uh, the, the repo link for the, uh, mint pie and aria tools are in the, uh, in the slides. Um, we haven't yet posted the, uh, this notebook. Uh, it's, it should be available, uh, soon, uh, that, uh, we will get it into the, uh, the, the ASF um, open Sire lab uh, virtual machines come with a set of pre-installed notebooks and we will get this notebook included uh, in that set uh, after it's been uh, fully tested. Uh, there was some uh, issues that we ran into uh, recently that we want to make sure that it's working uh, before uh, we post the final version. The notebook for process, Looking at the landslide in Los Angeles is already in that SAR lab uh, GitHub repository. Okay, so the next question is question number eight. Till date, I've used two methods to perform INSAR analysis. One is using the SNAP tool uh, following the ESA tutorial. And the second one is Pi GMT SAR open source Python insert tool. If I get the final line of sight displacement maps from either of these, these methods, can I use MintPy to perform visualizations on these final products? Um, asking because the visualization capabilities of MintPy seem to be pretty good. Yes, there are ways to uh, load, uh, to process a stack of date of uh, interferograms with snap from the ESA, the ESA snap tool. Uh, and it is then possible to uh, load those into MintPy. Uh, there's information on the MintPy website for how to use snap uh, interferograms. Um, there's two, uh, two versions of, of the, there's a, Pi GMT SAR is a is a modified version of a software package called GMT SAR. Um, the original GMT SAR package is supported by uh, MintPy. Um, I don't know the changes that have been made by the um, the person that's been working on uh, the Pi GMT SAR. Uh, modified version. So I, I can't tell you whether uh, the Pi GMT SAR uh, products can be um, loaded into MidPi. It may that that would be something you could ask to the uh, Pi GMT SAR uh, author. Okay, question number nine. If you had a GPS measurement for a reference point during the time series, how can you include the measured displacements into the processing flow? Uh, that's a uh, um, that's a, a, a good question. The uh, the key thing is that all the INSAR measurements are relative, so. Um, what we sometimes do is uh, use a GPS station that we know is not moving very much as the reference point. Um, and therefore, we then we tie the, the INSAR measurements to that reference point. 
if the GPS measurement is moving uh, rapidly, then you would need to add that um, uh, GPS motion to the um, projected into the radar line of sight. If you want to compare that to uh, to include that with the INSAR uh, measurements. All right, so the next question, which is question number 10, how do you compute the deformation rate centimeters per year from the time series displacements? The mint pie package does a just does a, a linear uh, least squares fit to the displacements for all the dates in the in the time series. Um, you can do a linear fit. Uh, you in some kit, uh, you can also optionally include the seasonal uh, which for for more advanced analysis. So it's basically doing a, a linear fit to the time series for every pixel in the image. Okay, so the next question, number 11, how can we create a data set for SBAS in SAR analysis? Uh, that's, a, that's a new, we can do that uh, with a number of pro, pro, uh, processing packages. Uh, the, there's the ARIA uh, pre-processed interferograms that uh, we used in this demonstration. Uh, you could also process data using uh, the ICE package, ISCE. That's an open source package, or the uh, ESA SNAP tool, and uh, the ASF also has a a uh, on demand uh, INSAR processing. Uh, Function that you can request them to process data uh, using the uh, ASF uh, type three gamma is what it's called uh, processing tool that then also can be loaded in the mid point. Okay, question number twelve: Does MintPy use other techniques besides small baseline? No, the, the MintPy package is designed to use the small baseline uh, method. It doesn't uh, do uh, other other methods. There is a new uh, package that's, uh, that works with MintPy to do uh, persistent scatterer analysis uh, that's also available on GitHub. It, it works uh, with the same files. Okay, question number 13. Why should I choose a fixed point to determine the velocity? Will the line of sight not be sufficient? INSAR measurements are always uh, relative. We can't, um, we can't get the absolute displacement so uh, we have to choose a reference point uh, to do the uh, the time series analysis. And the by definition, the uh, the def the displacement at that point is set to zero. That's uh, that's just the nature of uh, any kind of INSAR analysis. Uh, there's a second part of this question here. Yeah, actually, I, I meant to, that's an additional question. So okay, I've included that. Okay, next question, okay. Yeah. So the next question is number 14. Do you have any experience with using INSAR displacement data as a calibration data set for groundwater models, such as ModFlow, for example? Uh, I have not done this, but other people have. I've used INSAR displacements to better uh, understand the flow of groundwater.
Okay, so moving on then to the next question, number 15, can this data be used to measure groundwater re recharge just as it measures subsidence? Is it as simple as saying positive subsidence values equal groundwater recharge? Yes, that is uh, true, that uh, when the groundwater is recharged, then the surface moves up. Uh, you might call that uh, uplift of the ground surface instead of subsidence. And that is an indication of a recharge of the aquifers. Nice. Okay, question 16. Is INSAR-based land deformation possible irrespective of area, particularly forest or season? The uh, Sentinel-1 satellite uses the C-band uh, or six centimeter radar wavelength, and that radar uh, will not work well in areas of dense forest uh, for INSAR. That is the main reason why uh, NISAR will be using the longer uh, L-band wavelength to better uh, do INSAR in forested areas. Um, snow cover <clears throat> will also be a problem in, in certain areas. Even L-band SAR will not work uh, when, when the ground is covered with snow. Okay, uh, so the next question, number 17. In the case of urban areas, what is the effect of construction on the accuracy of the assessment or the measurement? We can only do the uh, interferometric measurements if the uh, objects on the ground are staying constant when uh, the uh, when there's uh, large-scale construction, uh, creating new buildings or tearing down old buildings, that will uh, cause a loss of coherence and uh, prevent measurement of the uh, surface uh, displacements. This is actually uh, also a way that we can measure uh, damage caused by earthquakes or, or hurricanes by looking at the INSAR coherence change that's uh, due to uh, destruction of buildings, uh, we can detect uh, how, how, where the buildings have been damaged. Okay, question 18. Could fluvial geomorphological changes be studied using INSAR? Uh, what? Fluvial uh, geomorpholo geological, geomorphological changes uh, would generally include uh, erosion or deposition. Uh, and those are also effects that are going to change the surface. And therefore, we can only see that something has changed. It, it'll cause a loss of coherence. Uh, you could detect where these uh, Fluvial changes have occurred, but we can't measure the amount of change, except by using uh, the the topographic mode of INSAR, uh, such as with Tandem X. Okay, question number nineteen. I think this question can be uh, interpreted in two ways. So, are these data set available to everyone? Or are these and or are these data set available all over the the world? Ah uh, yes, uh, the Sentinel One uh, uh, raw data is available uh, for most parts of the world, uh, almost everywhere, and it's uh, free and open. Uh, the ARIA Sentinel-1 geocoded unwrapped fi files are only available for selected areas uh, in where, where we have funding to, to process the data. Uh, the NISAR uh, 
geocoded unwrapped interferograms will be available uh, globally and, and free and open. Okay, question 20. How do you select the spatial and temporal thresholds for the INSAR processing and how can it be validated uh, or how can you make sure that the SBAS processing was carried out correctly? Uh, yes. Uh, the with Sentinel one, uh, they operate the satellites uh, in a way that we don't worry about the spatial baselines because they're always short. Uh, that will also be true for NISAR and. Uh, so that's not a problem. Uh, the temporal uh, threshold uh, is going to depend on the uh, amount of vegetation in the area where you're working. In a, an area with moderate vegetation, uh, Sentinel-1 interferograms with uh, intervals of more than uh, usually about uh, uh, 48 days uh, lose coherence. And so then you may need to use only shorter time intervals. So that, that's the temporal threshold. Uh, it, it depends on the radar wavelength and on the vegetation. For L band, we hope that the uh, the temporal threshold will be uh, closer to a year, uh, except. Okay, question number 21, interesting question here. Uh, is subsidence related, specifically related to groundwater extraction or could it be generated from other activities such as oil and gas extraction? And if so, can we use the same methodology that was presented today? Yes, it's uh, we can use exactly the same methodology to measure uh, subsidence due to other causes. In fact, I uh, studied uh, subsidence due to uh, oil extraction uh, about 25 years ago in, uh, in very close to this area in the in California. There's some very uh, rapidly uh, extracting uh, oil fields. So it's the same methodology. Great. Okay. So another great question. Uh, number 22. Could we expect as an extra feature of MinPy to be able to compute up and down east west deformation besides only line of sight? Uh, from in, any uh, given track of data, we only measure uh, one line of sight, but in most places, there are the satellites. Uh, Acquire data on different tracks that can look at the same ground location at different uh, look directions. And there is all a function in MintBy to combine what we call uh, the, the ascending and descending uh, tracks of, of data to estimate the up, down, and east, west components. Ascending is where the satellite is moving northward relative to the Earth, and descending is where, where the satellite is moving southward. So uh, those look in opposite directions and therefore give different different line of sight uh, information to that can be combined to estimate these two two components. But you have to have the two different. So you process the two. Uh, track separately and then combine the uh, resulting velocity, line of sight velocities. Question 23. Do you think that we can correlate INSAR line of sight displacement results with GRACE groundwater trend data? Would this be meaningful? Uh, yes, people have uh, thought about ways to do this. The big difference is the spatial scale. 
GRACE measures uh, the groundwater change, uh, mass change at about a 400 kilometer spatial scale, whereas INSAR is measuring change on a 100 meter spatial scale. So that's a, a factor of a, a thousand difference in spatial scale. So it would require um, some thought how, how you can combine those effectively. Okay, and going back to the previous question about using this method to look at sub subsidence due to oil extraction, someone um, wrote on the chat box that uh, they would be very grateful if you could share some links to studies related to this. So that's perhaps something that can be included in this document when we post it. Sure, I can uh, link to my paper from 1998. Oh, wow. Wonderful. Okay. So let's move on then to the next question. Number 24. Can SAR track and monitor groundwater content in an alluvial aquifer that surrounds a river as stream flow increases and decreases? Um, the, uh, you might be able to uh, measure, uh, variations in groundwater uh, due to river flow, uh, but I suspect the amplitude of those variations are, are much smaller than what we can measure with INSAR. Okay, question number 25, a very, uh, a very interesting question here. What are some of the potential applications of these techniques that were discussed today for interplanetary missions. How are the current missions that are being planned for interplanetary missions using this sort of technique? The uh, NASA Veritas mission uh, is planning to use uh, SAR interferometry uh, to measure uh, displacements on Venus. So that's a uh, it's an approved mission. It's planning uh, to go to Venus. All right, number 26, question 26. What will be the difference in ground deformation derived from L band and X band? And which one is more suitable for geohazards? Uh, the ground displacements should be the same, but the difference will be primarily in the uh, coherence of the measurements. If there's, uh, if it's a unvegetated area or area of urbanized area uh, where there's little change in the in little vegetation, they should give similar results. But in uh, vegetated areas, uh, especially forest, X band will become be uh, completely incoherent and therefore not be able to make any INSAR measurements. Okay, question 27. Is it possible to monitor urban water pollution with SAR data? Uh, water pollution. Uh, the SAR data does not uh, penetrate into water, so we can't measure anything about the water uh, quality. Question 28. Have there been significant developments in land subsidence prediction? And if possible, could you share some resources for further reference? Uh, the California Department of, of, of Water Resources has been using INSAR for uh, uh, several years now to monitor uh, groundwater extraction throughout the state of California. Uh, 
the area of um, extreme subsidence that I showed in the demonstration is one of the areas that they are selected for uh, the first effort to control groundwater extraction in, in the state of California under a new uh, groundwater uh, control law that takes effect uh, in the next few years. Okay, and then the final question, have there been developments made toward real-time INSAR analysis? And if so, can you share any references? Um, not sure what they're referring to with real-time INSAR. Um, the processing of SAR uh, images uh, takes some amount of time. Uh, so there's always going to be uh, some amount of delay. Uh, with the present satellite systems, it usually takes uh, several hours for the data to, to be actually be sent down to the ground. So uh, we don't usually talk about real time, but we talk about near real time. Uh, products for, for SAR and in, in, in SAR analysis. Okay. Oh, and then I guess we, we received uh, another question here. Number 30, how is measured subsidence affected by crop phenology? If we're measuring an area where the crop is growing, also what is the spatial resolution we're looking at in this product? Is it 10 meters? Uh, so the growth of um, vegetation uh, crops uh, usually causes a loss of coherence. Uh, so in you might be, uh, see the amount of a coherence loss as a measurement of the amount of crop height change. Um, so uh, generally, uh, that's why we use the uh, the longer radar wavelengths. So they're less sensitive to uh, changes in the in the trees uh, to get to INSAR measurements. What is the spatial resolution? The uh, the ARIA Sentinel-1 uh, geocoded unwrapped interferograms are processed at 90 meter uh, resolution. It's possible to get higher resolution with, uh, but that's the uh, standard uh, products are at 90 meter spacing. You could get down to uh, about 30 meters with Sentinel-1. Other satellites might uh, be smaller, uh, uh, higher resolution, especially the X-band satellites. Okay, and we have yet another question here. It is now related to a uh... A DM. So, how accurate would a DM be that is derived using INSAR? Uh, the accuracy of a uh, INSAR DEM depends on the um, the distance between the two uh, radar antennas uh, for and the. Uh, and the resolution of the SAR images used. Uh, so for SRTM, the accuracy was on about uh, 10 meters elevation. For uh, the Tandem X mission, it's uh, better uh, probably around uh, three meters. All right, and it's, uh, it's the INSAR uh, height accuracy. 
is 10 meters. I'm not... There's airborne radar systems that have um, higher resolution, uh, higher accuracy. Okay, we have another question coming in. It's not on the Google Doc here yet, but the question is, do you have experience using INSAR displacement data as a calibration data set for groundwater models such as ModFlow? Uh, didn't we answer that before? Did we? Okay. I thought it might be familiar. Okay, so here's another one. Crops, uh, to map crop water consumption, is it possible to do this with SAR? And what would be the best method? Uh, crop water consumption. Uh, the the, the uh, INSAR is really only sensitive to the ground surface. The use of water by the crops uh, would be more from the uh, soil moisture measurements uh, that are not using INSAR, but the, the SAR amplitude images. Okay, great. Uh, so I think that's it now in terms of the questions that have come in. Um, so that will mark then the end of this Q&A session. Um, I would like to thank our speaker once again, Dr. Eric Fielding, for, uh, for this great presentation demonstration for really introducing this topic on looking at subsidence from groundwater extraction uh, with INSAR for the first time in an RSET training. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that the presentation uh, the recording and the transcript for this Q&A will be posted online um, under in, in the uh, training page for this uh, webinar series. The next session is tomorrow, we, tomorrow, November 1st, Wednesday, and we will have Dr. Franz Meyer from the Alaska Satellite Facility and also University of Alaska Fairbanks. He will be talking about detecting and monitoring floods with SAR. I'd like to also remind you that there will be a homework associated with this webinar series and that will be made available tomorrow. So it will be open up tomorrow and you will have until November 17 to, um, to send in your homework. And for those that have attended live and that complete the homework by the due date, those people will receive a certificate of completion. So before I close, I would like to thank the RSET team for making this possible. Brock Blevin, Selwyn Hudson-Odoi, Natasha Johnson-Griffin, Sarah Kutshaw, Jonathan O'Brien, Amita Mehta, Sean McCartney. And I would like to thank all of the participants for your enthusiasm, for all the great questions coming in, and for your overall interest in, uh, in, in SAR. So before closing, um, Dr. Fielding, would you like to say any final words? Uh, well, thanks to people for uh, joining the live session here. And uh, we hope that people will uh, and apply this to their own areas. And we're looking forward to NISAR mission launch next year. Absolutely, very much looking forward to that. So with that, we end today's session. Uh, wishing everyone a great day and uh, please uh, tune in tomorrow for the final session. Thank you. Thank you.